management of ovarian cysts in postmenopausal and premenopausal women. Today we will speak about assessment of postmenopausal ovarian cyst, risk assessment, CA125 and its rule, ultrasound and its rule and the criteria and difference between benign and malignant cysts, risk of malignancy index scoring system, IOTA group classification, management algorithm, and premenopausal ovarian cysts. We will start with management in postmenopausal women. First step in the management is the assessment which is three main components, history, examination, and investigation. Our aim from history is identify any risk factors which increase the risk for the woman for developing ovarian cancer, and to identify if there is any acute condition which require urgent intervention. And by acute condition, I mean any complication of this ovarian cyst, like torsion, hemorrhage, rupture, so the patient can present with acute abdominal pain. For risk assessment, we know that there are certain risk factors, especially in family history, which increase the patient risk for developing ovarian cancer. We will discuss that in the second slide. Examination. Our aim for examination is to do general abdominal and pelvic assessment. By general examination, we emphasize on the importance of high body mass index. By abdominal assessment, we are looking for any palpable pelvic abdominal mass or ascites. By pelvic assessment, we are searching for the criteria for this mass in regard to nodularity, tenderness, irregularity of the surface. Investigation. CE-125, ultrasound, and MRI as a second line. By risk assessment, we speak about the family history. So if the woman has two or more individuals with ovarian cancer who are first degree relatives of each other, or one individual with ovarian cancer at any, at any age, and one with breast cancer diagnosed under the age of 50, or one relative with ovarian cancer at any age, and two relatives had breast cancer diagnosed under the age of 60, or three or more family members with colon cancer, or two has colon cancer and one has a stomach, ovarian, endometrial, urinary tract, or small bowel cancers in two generations, one of these cancers must be diagnosed under the age of 50, and affected relatives should be first degree relative to each other, or one individual with both breast and ovarian cancer. Another risk is the uh, carrier of BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. These genes increase risk for breast and ovarian cancer in the individual. Either the woman is tested and is positive for these mutations, or the woman is a first degree rel relative but she is not tested for an affected individual, or the woman is untested but she is first degree relative of an affected man who is a relative for a woman affected by these genes before. CA125, it is the only serum tumor marker which is used for primary evaluation for postmenopausal ovarian cyst. However, it shouldn't be used in isolation, and this is because CA125 can be high and different gynecological and non-gynecological condition. So for gynecological condition like pelvic inflammatory disease, fibroids, endometriosis, and any complication of ovarian cysts can lead to high CA125. Also, it can be high in non-gynecological condition which cause peritoneal irritation, like in case of cholecystitis, hepatitis, cirrhosis, pancreatitis, etc. All these conditions increase the level of CA125. That's why it is not that diagnostic of ovarian cancer and shouldn't be used in isolation, but it should be used in conjunction with the clinical picture and the ultrasound features. Another tumor marker, which is human epidermal protein 4, is still under research, but the trials found that this protein is more sensitive and more specific than CA125. This is because it is not raised in endometriosis, 
It's mainly raised in case of ovarian cancer as well as other cancers, lung, pancreas, breast, bladder, urethral thousand cell carcinoma, and endometrial cancer. So there's some evidence that combination of HE4 and serum CA125 is more specific but less sensitive than either marker and isolation, but RCP4 is still under trial and must be used in clinical practice. Ultrasound. It remains the first line of investigation for ovarian system postmenopause, and the idea of ultrasound is to identify the criteria of malignancy. As we will speak before about the difference between benign and malignancy in regard to the ultrasound features. So for a cyst to be benign with no concerning feature, it's rounded or oval, has thin membranes, has posterior acoustic enhancement, has no boundary projections or solid area, and an echoic fluid. But from a malignant cyst, it can be irregular, can be multilocular, has septations inside, has biliary projections, and has increased blood flow. Combination of color Doppler with ultrasound can be of a benefit as malignant images generally demonstrate new vascularity with abnormal branching pattern or vessel morphology, and these new vessels usually have lower resistance flow than native ovarian vessels. So if you suspect an ovarian malignancy by ultrasound, next step will be to do a CT scan to identify metastasis, ascites, lymph node enlargement, and then you refer to an MDT. For MRI, it is not the first line of investigation, usually it's the second line. However, it is of value if the cyst is indeterminate in nature, so the ultrasound cannot differentiate between benign and malignant. And in this case, MRI can help to identify vegetations as well as ascites. Different scoring systems have been developed in order to identify whether this cyst is benign or malignant. One of the most common scoring systems is risk of malignancy index. And the risk of malignancy index is equation of multiplication of three factors together, which is U, which is ultrasound feature. So, the ultrasound features which are characteristic of malignancy is multilocular, solid, metastasis, bilateral, bilateral, and ascites. If there is none of these features, so it's a score 0. If it is 1, score 1, and any feature between 2 and 5 features will score 3. M is the menopausal status, so premenopause score 1, postmenopause score 3, and then multiply by the number of CA125. Then, if the rate of this calculation is less than 25, this means that the risk of malignancy for this woman is less than 3%. If the risk of malignancy index is less than 250, so the risk is about 20%. And if the risk is more than 250, so the risk of malignancy is about 75%. And based on that, we can plan whether to go for conservative or surgery, whether surgery be laparoscopy or laparotomy, whether it can be done in a general unit or an gynae oncology center. Other classification systems have been developed, but are still under uh, research, like the OVA-1, which is combination of five uh, markers together, and the equation uh, of these markers will help to identify whether it's malignant or not. And another classification system, which make use of both CA-125 and the human epidermal factor 4, but again, as HE4 is still under trial, this scoring system is still not for use except in research. Here we find a comparison between the criteria of a simple cyst and ultrasound, which will be rounded over, thin, wall, posterior acoustic shadowing, anechoic fluid, absence of septation, and the criteria of a complex cyst or malignancy, which will be complete septations, solid nodules, boundary projections. So if there are any of these worrying features, there is increased risk of malignancy about 8% for multilocular, 36 to 39% for lesion with solid animals. Another classification, which is a Utah group simple ultrasound rules, and they classified into P rules for benign cyst and M rule for malignant cyst. So benign cyst is unirregular, presence of solid component where the largest solid component is less than 7 mm, presence of acoustic shadowing. A small multilocular tumor with the largest less than 10 cm, no blood flow on color doubler. But the M rules will be a regular solid tumor, ascites, 
four papillary projections at least, largest irregular multilocular solid tumor with diameter of more than 10 centimeters and prominent blood flow and color doublet. This algorithm is from the Royal College guideline, which describes the management of postmenopausal ovarian cysts. So we'll start with the assessment for the risk of malignancy by measuring CA125 transvaginal ultrasound plus minus transabdominal ultrasound as transabdominal ultrasound can add to the transvaginal ultrasound especially in large ovarian cysts or as the cyst is away from the pelvis so it's away from the scope of the transvaginal ultrasound and then we calculate the risk of malignancy index you will end up having two options either the risk of malignancy index is less than 200 then you will look at the ultrasound criteria of the cyst if the cyst is simple less than 5 cm asymptomatic, unilateral, unilocular, then there is a good rule for conservative management in which you repeat the ultrasound and CA125 in 4 to 6 months. If no change, you can either repeat again in another 4 to 6 months or go for surgery. If there is a change, then you have to go to surgery. If cyst resolves completely, patient can be discharged. However, if the cyst has any features of suspicious, like being large more than 5 cm, multilocular, bilateral, or the solid components, in this case, it is better to consider surgery. And if you're going to consider surgery, it will be serpent or oophorectomy, and usually bilateral. In postmenopausal ovarian cyst, the management is removal of the whole ovary rather than cystectomy because of the risk of malignancy, and every effort should be made to avoid the spillage of the cystic content in the peritoneal cavity because the spillage of cancer cells in the peritoneal cavity will upgrade the stage of cancer. That's why also laparoscopic approach is preferred. We prefer that the cyst will be drained in the endobag and it's usually done through the umbilical port as it proves that drainage through the umbilical port will be less post-operative pain as well as better recovery than if you do the same through the lateral port. If the risk of malignancy index is more than or equal to 100, in this case, we need to refer to CT scan to identify omental metastasis, hepatic metastasis, ascites, lymph node enlargement, obstructive uropathy, to make sure that there is no risk of malignancy. So if this, then to refer to MDT, and then it be a decision whether she is high risk of malignancy, so she has to be referred to gynae oncology center for total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral serpentoophorectomy, omental biopsy, cytology, pelvic and paraortic lymphadenectomy if needed or the risk of malignancy index is low and in this case she, the patient can be managed in the local gynae center by total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral abdominal hysterectomy, a mental biopsy and cytology usually it's done through a midline incision to allow for adequate exploration for premenopausal ovarian cyst there are certain points of similarity and difference between postmenopausal. For similarity to be the same, the history taking and the examination was the main was the same aim like postmenopausal ovarian cyst. For investigation, CA125 here may not be of a high value like postmenopausal. And as before, the CA125 is raised in many different conditions. And most differential diagnosis of a premenopausal ovarian cyst will lead to high CA125. However, it's a must if the ultrasound shows that any solid component to do alpha free to protein and beta HCG and LDH to exclude germ cell tumor. The ultrasound here will remain the main mode of assessment of an ovarian cyst to look whether it's a simple or a complex. CA125 is high and less than 200. In this case, you have to exclude other differential diagnosis like endometriosis. And if it is high, it needs serial monitoring, as evidence shows that persistent elevated CE125 is more risky than a single high value of CE125, which comes to a drop down. And if CE125 is more than 200, we have to discuss with the gynae oncology. Then based with the ultrasound feature, if the ultrasound feature show an ovarian cyst, which is simple, less than 5 cm, usually it's a functional cyst usually will resolve within three months and accordingly there is no need for follow-up but if it is between five and seven centimeter it needs a follow-up after a year 
However, if it is larger or more complex, it will require MRI or even surgical intervention. You have to note that ovarian cysts which persist or increase in size are unlikely to be functional and will need surgical intervention. And again, by surgery, we prefer the laparoscopic approach. However, every cautious should be taken to avoid pillage of the content of the cyst, especially if the cyst is suspicious to be a dermoid cyst, because dermoid cyst can lead to chemical peritonitis if the contents are spread in the cavity. And if this happens incidental, we need to do meticulous peritoneal lavage with warm saline, avoid cold water as cold water can lead to hypothermia plus difficulty in getting the content out of the, vel out of the pelvis because of calcification of fat content. The use of combined pills does not promote the resolution of functional cysts. This presentation was based on the Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists Green Top Guidelines. Thank you for your time. I hope you liked the presentation. Mohammed Nashati, Obstetrics and Gynecology Consultant UK, Lecture, Ozirna Gynecology, Cairo University.